Finite difference time domain and electromagnetics. So we're going to build on the previous lecture and talk about how to use the finite difference method to solve Maxwell's equations for electromagnetics in the time domain. And don't worry, you don't have to be an expert in electromagnetics to follow what we're doing here. I will cover the sequence of developing your code. It's a huge mistake, really in all of research, if you have a big problem to just jump in and try to solve everything all at once. Instead, we break our problem down into a bunch of much more palatable steps, small steps that we can sort of measure our results. And this is the same thing for developing a something more sophisticated like a finite difference time domain code and electromagnetics. So there's a certain sequence that I like to develop these in. And even if I'm developing my own code with all the experience I have, I will still go through the same sequence. We'll discuss sources and finite difference time domain. How do we inject waves into the simulation? We'll talk a little bit about the algorithm, things like stability, and then we'll end with a similar discussion of code development sequence, but for two-dimensional finite difference time domain. So let's get right into this. Time domain solution of Maxwell's equations. Again, I promised we don't have to be an expert in electromagnetics here, but uh, time domain electromagnetics is essentially described by two equations that we like to call the curl equations. And this del operator cross product the electric field, this is called the curl. It is calculating the tendency of the electric field to circulate about a certain axis. And we're setting that equal to the time change of the magnetic field and with some proportionality constant. This is actually called the permeability and it characterizes how much a magnetic field is interacting with a medium. And so the way we interpret this is the more stronger the circulation of the electric field, the more quickly it would change the magnetic field down the axis of that circulation. And then the other equation, we calculate the curl of the magnetic field, and that calculates the tendency of the magnetic field to be circulating about an axis. And the stronger that curl, the more quickly the electric field will be changing down the axis of that. And we have this epsilon, which is another material parameter called the permittivity, and that's characterizing how much the electric fields interact with the medium. So the way we can roughly think about this is we could think of a changing electric field will induce a changing magnetic field, then a changing magnetic field will induce a changing electric field, and this goes back and forth. So we can imagine now we're going to have an array of all of our electric fields, an array of all our magnetic fields, and we'll calculate the curl of one, use that to update the other, and calculate the curl of the other to update the, the previous. So we bounce back and forth, EH, 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 EH. And at first we initialize everything to zero. So we're bouncing back and forth, EH, 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 and nothing's happening, back and forth, back and forth. And that's the heartbeat of finite difference time domain then somewhere in our simulation, we're going to toss some numbers in, maybe to a single point or to two adjacent points. And now we're going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. As we throw those numbers into the simulation, we watch those numbers trickle across the grid. And what we're actually watching is the waves propagating across the grid and interacting with our devices. And then we can learn everything we need to learn about the device. That's finite difference time domain. We've talked a lot about when we have multiple functions that we will stagger them. And in electromagnetics, in fact, we have six functions. We might think, oh, there's only electric magnetic fields, but those are vector quantities. They have X, Y, Z components. So we have X, Y, Z for E, the electric field, and X, Y, Z for the magnetic field. So that's six functions across our grid total. And so we stagger them. This was first done by Dr. Kane Yi, and so to this day, we call this the Yi grid. But really, it's just the logical way we would stagger the fields the way we discussed earlier with the finite difference method. So this is staggering in space. We also stagger in time. So let's look at that. So in our curl operations, this is where we have our spatial derivatives, x, y, z, and so I think we're pretty comfortable with how that would be staggered. So let's focus our attention on the time derivatives. So let's look down here first. So we have a time derivative of the electric field. So we will say the electric field at the future time step 
minus the electric field at the previous time step divided by the time step. That gives us uh, an estimation or an approximation of the first order time derivative. Now, where does this term exist in time? It exists at the midpoint between t plus delta t and t. So this term actually exists at the halfway point between time steps or t plus delta t over two. So in fact, what we'll do is we're going to define our magnetic fields to exist at those half time steps. That way we don't have to do any kind of crazy interpolations. So our electric fields will exist at the, I'll call, I'll call it the integer time steps, and the magnetic fields will exist at the half time steps. Now we can go up and we can look at how we're handling the time derivative for the magnetic fields, which we've just said are now going to exist at sort of those half time steps. So it will be the magnetic field at t plus delta t over 2 minus the magnetic field at t minus delta t over 2, all divided by delta t. Where does this term exist in time? t, which is exactly where we define the electric field to exist. So we're staggering them in both time and space, and this all works out, but we do have to keep track of these fields being at different points in time and space because that matters. When we inject waves, these field components are in different locations. They'll be out of phase slightly, and we need to compensate for that. They're also at slightly different time steps. So again, that introduces a slight phase delay between E and H, and we absolutely have to account for all this or problems arise. So here's our update equations. We won't talk too much about the curl equations because you've already seen how spatial derivatives work, but we now have these finite difference equations for time. We will solve both of these for the two field values that exist at the future time steps. And so that's what we're writing over here. So here is our two update equations. And like before, we have these things, our update coefficients. This coefficient is not changing as a function of time. Now this permeability is changing as a function of space. So this update coefficient becomes a, uh, an array across the entire grid. And it's kind of like we have an update equation hiding behind each point on the grid. In fact, we have two update equations. And if we look at this as the vector components, that really means we have behind each point in the grid hiding six different update equations. Like we talked about for the heat equation, we have a stability condition. We do not want the physical wave to travel faster than a numerical wave could. The way we could do our finite differences here is that one point is coupled to immediately adjacent points. So it would be impossible for a number to travel more than one grid cell in a single time step. So we have to make sure that our time step is small enough that the physical wave would not need to do that. And so, here's the actual current stability condition here's actually how i like to write it i like to look at my my grid and i have my resolution parameters delta x delta y delta z i'll just take the smallest one and i'll use that i'll also look across my entire grid for the minimum refractive index which actually affects the the maximum wavelength i'll divide that by two times the speed of light and this builds a little bit of uh, conservatism into it compared to the actual pure stability condition. And so I tend to go with that one, but it's based on the same principles we talked about with the heat equation. Now it's called the current stability condition in finite difference time domain. Sequence of code development for one dimensional finite difference time domain. So the very first thing that I like to do, and I also have my students do, is implement the basic update equations. This is the EH, EH, EH. So we'll calculate the curl of the magnetic fields, we'll update the electric fields, then calculate the curl of the electric fields and update the magnetic fields, and we'll go back and forth, back and forth, EH, EH, EH. Well, if that's all we've done, nothing should happen, right? Because we have not thrown any numbers into the grid, we have not injected any kind of source. So that's great because if something does happen, then clearly something's wrong with the code. So that's the first thing, just the basic update equations and we should see literally nothing happening. The next thing to do is add a simple soft source. So at some point we throw in some numbers and we actually throw in a Gaussian function and we can watch that pulse travel in opposite directions. And when we get to the edge of the grid, we have finite difference equations that need values from the outside. So what I've done here is just assume that they're zero, which means that those boundaries will reflect. 
And now we can watch those pulses come back in and we can watch them pass through each other. And if we kept watching this, they would keep bouncing back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And we could watch that all day. What we're looking for is to make sure that these aren't exploding or when they hit the boundaries or something crazy doesn't happen. So that's a soft source. We're just throwing some energy in our simulation, watching it hit the boundaries and seeing what happens. Next, we'll add a perfect boundary condition. So we do something at the edges to make the wave appear as if it keeps just propagating off the grid and going forever. But really what we're doing is just subtracting the wave in the cell that sort of exists outside the grid. And this was the real reason we just wanted the simple soft source. We just wanted to throw pulses at our boundaries to make sure that that's working. We typically don't want that pulse to reflect off the boundary, right? Because if we're trying to simulate a device and figure out how much of a pulse reflects off our device, well, if that pulse also reflects off the grid boundaries, then how do we separate the two? And it can be very confusing. So we want the waves to look as if they just continue off, continue off to infinity. We want to take better control over that pulse. We really would only like it to go in one direction. So this one way source, the way I teach doing it is using the total field scatter field technique. And essentially we declare one half of the grid as total field quantities, which contains the source and everything that gets reflected from the device and the other half, the scattered field. So in this case, the left half is the scattered field. So we would only see what gets reflected off a device, which is nothing right now because there is no device. And we don't have the source over here. And that's one way to do it. It's a simple way, I like that. And so now we're taking better control over our source. This point will move the position of where we're injecting it all the way over to the left, because if we inject it in the right, we're wasting all this space over to the left. Now we have all of the space to put devices here. And that's typically how we want to do. We want to inject all the way over to the left. The other thing we're doing is we're adding a calculation of transmission and reflection. And since we're simulating nothing or literally just air, uh, once the pulse passes this far right boundary, you'll see the transmission jump up and flatline at one or 100% and reflection stays down at 0%. So this is a great thing to do, simulate nothing and make sure we get 100% transmission and 0% reflection. Great way to benchmark your code. Now we'll actually add a device. Now we're watching a wave interacting with that device. Maybe we're learning about the device and we're plotting transmission and reflection again. There's a third line that you can't see yet, and that's transmission plus reflection. That is the dash black line. Well, assuming we haven't simulated anything with loss, transmission plus reflection should be a flat line 100%. Otherwise, where's the energy going? And so that's exactly how we test our code. But you'll notice that this has not flatlined yet, and that's because there's still energy stuck this is a resident device that's bouncing back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And we have to just keep letting the simulation run and run and run until finally that energy leaves. And we can tell that that's happening either by tracking the amplitude of the fields in the simulation or by looking at the flatness of that conservation curve. And so, as you remember from the beginning of the simulation, that did not flatline at first. And that's because energy was stuck in the simulation. So actually time domain methods are really not great for simulating highly resonant devices because they have to run for so long. And remember every iteration we're introducing error, a very small amount of error, but we're introducing that. And if we have to let the simulation run and run and run, those errors are accumulating. The errors we started off with don't go away. They stay there and they build and we're introducing new error. So we really want to do a lot to try to minimize number of iterations. And these resonant devices are just tough. A frequency domain simulation doesn't have problems with the resonance. That's a time domain simulation. So this is really just sort of my hand drawn freeze frame of what we were looking at in the previous slides because you can't run a simulation looking at the PDF notes. So uh, we won't spend any time on this. Sources in finite difference time domain. We have what's called a simple hard source, and we literally just overwrite a value on the grid with our function, our source that we want to inject, in this case, a Gaussian pulse. Now, watch what happens. Any kind of backward waves, 
this is a hard sort of boundary. They reflect off of it. Waves can't get through this. And that is usually a problem. So that's a simple hard shot. It's the absolute simplest, but I've never actually seen that one used in practice. It's discussed a lot, but I've never seen it used in practice. All right, that's the simple hard source. In contrast is the simple soft source. Rather than overwrite a field value, we add to whatever's already there. Now when pulses reflect, they're free to just pass through that. This is what's used, I'll say every time there's a source used in finite difference time. And I may be wrong about that because obviously I'm not aware of every simulation that's been run. Uh, but as far as I'm aware, all sources in finite difference time domain are always just simple soft sources. I'm not really sure how to use a, so a hard source and get that to work well. The total field Satter field, this is a one-way source. We're not sending any waves backwards now. Notice they're only ever going forward. And that's what we want because if we also send waves backwards, well, that's going to hit a boundary. And even though we might have an absorbing boundary, they never work perfectly. It's always going to reflect some. That's going to mess up our simulation to some degree. But this total field scatter field is also a soft source. Notice this reflected wave is able to pass right through it. Now, by setting up a simulation this way, something rather magical happens. Any fields that we look at on the scattered field side has to be what's reflected by the device. So if we want to calculate reflection, we want to do it by looking at the fields in the scattered field region, and we don't have to worry about somehow separating it from the source. If we want to look at gets transmitted through the device, we're looking at the far right-hand side. So it becomes very easy in this total field scatter field framework to look at and calculate reflected and transmitted fields. It's also a very good way to control the amplitude of the source. We're not sending waves backwards, so it minimizes error. It's just a very good way to do things. And so almost without exception, this is how I do all of my sources with the total field scatter field technique. FDTD algorithm. One thing we haven't talked about is how we actually calculate transmission and reflection. Well, we're recording what gets reflected and that's what's happening here. Over here, we're recording what gets transmitted and we're recording that. By exciting our device with a pulse and recording it this way, we're actually recording an impulse response. And we know that if we Fourier transform the impulse response, we get the frequency response. And that's exactly what we do, and it's that simple. Uh, and in fact, we can have Fourier transforms running in real time, so we don't actually have to record the reflected response. We don't have to store this in a big array because that could end up being a very big array. We can just Fourier transform and sort of on the fly as the simulation is running. But in concept, this is what's happening. We're recording impulse responses and Fourier transforming to get reflectance and transmittance. Here's a block diagram of a one-dimensional finite difference time domain algorithm. So what I'm not showing is initialization and dashboard stuff. So initializing, we're clearing the figure windows, clearing variables from memory, that sort of thing. And then our dashboard, this is where we declare sizes of devices, material properties, frequencies we may want to simulate, and all that. Once we enter the code, the first thing we'll do is we'll calculate everything about our grid. We'll calculate the grid resolution and how many points are on the grid. We'll then go ahead and build the device on the grid. Applying the current stability condition, we'll calculate our time step to ensure stability. And in this case, the boundary condition we're using to absorb outgoing waves actually requires a very specific calculation of delta T because we want the wave to travel one cell in two time clicks exactly. And if that's not exact, the way our boundary condition is working will fail. From there, we'll calculate the source. We need to know how quick the source is to include all the frequencies we're interested in. 
We'd like to delay the source so we don't start in the middle of the source. And then we calculate a nice Gaussian pulse. From there, we'll calculate our update coefficients. We'll initialize all the fields to zero. We'll initialize the boundary term so we can do our fancy boundary condition. And now we enter the main loop. We will calculate the curl of the magnetic field to update E. We then do some things at the boundaries to do our, our boundary, our absorbing boundary condition. We then calculate the curl of H to update E. We record boundary stuff again. We inject the source. We visualize our fields and we keep doing this over. So we update H from E, E from H, back and forth, back and forth. And of course, we're doing some little extra things in there by handling our boundary terms. But that's it. That's the algorithm for finite difference time domain for one dimension. Something else that happens is something called numerical dispersion. This is a consequence of a wave traveling across a grid. So it's a numerical wave instead of a physical wave. So at first, let's look at what we want to happen. So this is a simulation happening where I took really good cautions to minimize numerical dispersion. So here we can't even tell what numerical dispersion is. We just see our Gaussian pulse, which contains a wide range of frequencies, just traveling across our grid. That's what we want. But if we don't take the right precautions, this is what happens. So here we have a pulse injected into our grid and look at what's happening on the tail. Notice these extra ripples. And this is happening because the different frequencies are traveling at different speeds and that pulse tends to spread and deform. We want all of those frequencies traveling at the same speed. And that's what was happening in the simulation above. This numerical dispersion can cause a lot of problems because this is not a physical thing. The physical wave would not behave like this traveling through air or a vacuum. A physical wave would travel very much like this, all the frequencies traveling at the same speed. So a lot of what happens in finite difference time domain is an attempt to minimize this numerical dispersion. And one brute force way to do it is just to crank up your grid resolution super high. But if you want to try to save memory and have simulations run faster, then we start applying a bunch of different tricks to minimize this numerical dispersion. We'll end this by talking about the sequence of code development for two-dimensional finite difference time domain. So we'll skip the step where nothing happens. Now we're going in with the soft source. And in two dimensions, if we just overwrite one little value or add to one little value, we see a ring uh, spread out. And here we're using Dirichlet boundary conditions, meaning the finite difference equations that require a value from outside the grid, we'll just assume all values outside the grid are zero. That forces the waves to reflect off the boundaries. So other than the step where nothing happens, this is the next step. And what we're watching for is to make sure that it doesn't explode, that it can run for a long time and we really just see the waves bouncing around. It looks quite beautiful. And that's just a way to check to make sure we have not made any mistakes in our update equations. Once we have that, we might want to try out a periodic boundary. So now the wave, instead of reflecting off a boundary, will leave that boundary and enter the other side. And this is how we can simulate structures that are periodic and really just simulate one unit cell. They look infinitely periodic by using these boundary conditions. So in terms of the wave, we get these similar kind of beautiful patterns we had on the previous slide, but for different reasons. The, the wave is leaving, leaving one side, coming in the other. And the real purpose of this is we're making sure that this doesn't explode. We're letting it run for a very long time. And we're also testing our periodic boundary conditions. Really what we would like to do is absorb our outgoing waves. We can't use that same boundary condition we use for the one dimensional simulation. So here we're using something called a perfectly matched layer. And what a perfectly matched layer is, we're building loss into the outside of the grid. But the problem with just blindly putting loss in is that we would be changing the impedance of the medium and we would actually get reflections off of the PML itself, not just the edge of the grid. So what we need to do is keep the impedance matched all the way through while we're introducing loss. And so since we're, since we're keeping that impedance perfectly matched to the problem space, this is called the perfectly matched layer. And typically this will be like 20 cells on the outside of my grids. 
and it makes the wave look as if they go off to infinity. Now what I'll do for simulating periodic structures like diffraction gratings, I'll use a PML at the top and the bottom. I will use my periodic boundaries left and right, and I will set up a total field scatter field source all the way across the grid, and I will practice by injecting a Gaussian source. And I do this in the middle of the grid because I wanna see if there's anything propagating backward. And if there is, then there's a mistake in my code and I need to go fix that. Now, of course, when I actually use this, I will be injecting the source much closer to the top so I can utilize this whole thing for simulating my device, utilize the whole grid for simulating my device. All right, same thing over here, but now we're adding calculation of transmittance and reflectance. Notice now we're going to be injecting the source at the top, but we still haven't added a device. We're simulating air, and what we should see is 100% transmission, 0% reflection. So I always recommend people when they first think they get their simulation running correctly, simulate nothing because we should get 100% reflection. And I'm, I'm sorry, we should get 0% reflection, 100% transmission. And then the very last thing to do is to add the device. So in this case, we're adding a diffraction grating. In comes a wave, it interacts with the grating. And we can see now that there's something much more interesting happening with transmission and reflection. And it will take a while for that conservation curve, this black dashed line, we're adding transmission plus reflection. It'll take a while for that to flatline. And we might ask why, why is there energy stuck here? Well, what's actually happening is a wave is coming in, it's getting diffracted. And some of those diffraction orders are actually traveling very near parallel to that interface. And so if they're traveling very near parallel, it takes them a long time to make their way down to leave. Not as long necessarily as a resonant device did that we saw earlier, but still it can take a very, very long time. And so we can check for our simulation being finished either by tracking the, you know, what's the strongest field value anywhere on the grid or by looking at flatness of the conservation or maybe even other things. So there's a complete simulation and we built it up in steps. Because you can't run the movies in the PDFs, here's sort of a freeze frame of everything we just talked about. This is really meant if you're looking at the PDF. So uh, we won't talk about what's happening here because we just did. I'll end this with a real simulation. This was done uh, the first time I actually ever taught finite difference time domain. And this was a project done by one of the groups. They were simulating a radar. And you can see that there's a, a radio frequency pulse that's transmitted out and it hits those two airplanes and reflects back. And what you're looking at on the right is what gets recorded by the radar system. And then of course, radar people could look at that and probably tell what kind of airplane it is, the name of the pilots, what they had for breakfast uh, and everything else. Uh, but it's neat that you can do this. And just watching the fields like this, it makes complicated things like radar become much more intuitive. And I absolutely love time domain simulations for learning and visualizing. It makes great movies, so I really enjoy it. Uh, if you have any interest, I actually do teach a semester long course in finite difference time domain for electromagnetics, and you can learn more about that there. From the bottom of my heart, thank you very much for watching this video. I love hearing your stories about how these videos helped you. I also love answering your questions. So please tell me your stories and ask your questions in the comment section. I promise I will try to answer every single question that's asked. If you like this video, hit the like and subscribe button. I also recommend visiting the official course website that has links to the latest versions of the notes, the latest videos, and there's lots of other resources to help you learn, including implementations in MATLAB. I'll see you in the next video.